you've probably heard that serotonin is the happiness molecule, but that's ridiculously simplistic. Serotonin, also known as 5-hydroxytryptamine or 5-HT, is a neurotransmitter molecule, a chemical that your brain uses to power a huge number of neurobiological processes, from sex and digestive processes to brain mechanisms behind hallucinogenic drugs like LSD, and yes, to emotions including happiness. So how does serotonin and the serotonin receptor do all this? In this video, we'll dive into how the serotonin receptors work and what they tell us about how the human brain works. We'll look first at the mechanism of serotonin neurotransmission and some of the nuances unique to serotonin. Next, we'll describe the seven families of serotonin receptors and what differentiates them. Finally, we will look at the individual roles that each receptor subtype plays in the human brain and body. This video is part of a playlist about serotonin, which covers serotonin receptors, which is this video, as well as the Rafi nuclei and anatomy, serotonin synthesis, and a hypothesis of the overall function of serotonin in the brain, which are the next three videos. With all of these, we will spend considerable time on the behavioral and cognitive functions of serotonin as they relate to the topics. This playlist is part of a larger series that serves as an introduction to neuroscience, so check out those earlier videos if you're interested or need an update on something. Now, I just want to note that this video marks a change for Sense of Mind to a new style, with more visuals, shorter video durations, and more. So you may notice that we only have two levels, long and short, and that's a change from the older intro to neuroscience videos, which had three levels. But I firmly believe that the long videos are now even more informative, while still avoiding too much jargon. It's just more packed into a smaller amount of time. But all right, that's enough jibber jabber from me. Let's get to this amazing molecule. First, the general mechanism of serotonin neurotransmission. Like all neurotransmitters, serotonin is released from the axon of a presynaptic neuron, and it floats across the synapse to the dendrite of a postsynaptic neuron that has receptors on its surface which bind to serotonin and then exert an effect on the neuron's likelihood of firing. Then, the serotonin molecules pop off their receptors and float back into the synapse where they're sucked up by the serotonin reuptake transporter, or SERT, CERT, and brought into the sender neuron to be reused later. That last step is important when considering how SSRIs work, that is, those antidepressants like Prozac. These drugs block the reuptake transporter so that there's more serotonin in the synapse and then that extra serotonin can continue to act on receptors. We'll talk more about this in future videos. Hey, if you're not sure what receptors or neurotransmitters are, then watch my videos on synaptic transmission and action potentials. However, here's the need to know. Neurotransmitters are molecules that bind to receptors on the surfaces of neurons and which change the neuron's voltage. Neurons fire when their voltage goes above a certain threshold, so a decrease makes a neuron less likely to fire, while an increase makes it more likely to fire. As we'll see in a moment, there are many types of serotonin receptors, some excitatory, others inhibitory. Serotonin is often described as a neuromodulator, rather than a classical neurotransmitter, because its effects are relatively weak, and because serotonin neurons typically have different receptors with stronger effects than serotonin. For example, about 75% of serotonergic neurons also have glutamate receptors. Serotonin can work extrasynaptically, meaning it can be released from areas of the neuron that are not part of the synapses. Then, instead of immediately binding to receptors on the receiving neuron, serotonin can diffuse through the dense web of other neurons and glial cells that occupy the space outside the neuron, and finally, bind to receptors on far-flung neurons. All right, next up, the families and subtypes of serotonin receptors. There are multiple versions of the serotonin receptor, categorized into seven types, called 5-HT1 through 7. 
Each of those has multiple serotonin receptor subtypes for a total of about 15 receptors, denoted by letters. For example, 5-HT2AR means serotonin receptor subtype 2A. And there's a gene coding for each of these subtypes. At most, a neuron expresses three distinct receptor subtypes. Almost all of them are metabotropic G-protein coupled receptors, or GPCRs, meaning they indirectly change the voltage of the cell. They do that by initiating a series of chemical reactions inside the neuron, which eventually lead to opening or closing of an ion channel, thereby making the cell more or less likely to fire. In other words, unlike ionotropic receptors, which are directly connected to an ion channel and function to simply open or close that channel when they bind to their neurotransmitters, these metabotropic receptors are not connected to an ion channel and they influence voltage indirectly. 5-HT receptors 1 and 5 inhibit the target neuron. They do this by inhibiting the formation of a molecule called cyclic AMP. This leads to opening of potassium channels that allow positively charged potassium ions to flow out of the cell, which decreases the voltage and decreases the chances of firing. They also help keep calcium channels closed. Calcium is required for neurons to fire, so this also lowers the chances of firing. The 5-HT2, 4, 6, and 7 receptors, on the other hand, excite the target neuron. Types 4, 6, and 7 probably do this by increasing cyclic AMP levels, helping to close those potassium channels that would otherwise allow potassium to flow out of the cell, the reverse of what types 1 and 5 do. Type 2 is similar, though it acts through a different series of chemical reactions that end with opening of calcium channels that allow calcium in by increasing levels of molecules called diacylglycerol and inositol triphosphate. Finally, 5-HT3 receptors are also excitatory and are actually ionotropic, meaning they're directly attached to an ion channel and can thus allow positive sodium ions in in order to raise the voltage of the cell and make it more likely to fire. While all the serotonin receptors are found in the nervous system, some are also present elsewhere in the body, including the GI tract, the blood vessels, platelets, and in muscle tissue. All right, now we get to the exciting part. What happens when you stimulate each of these receptors? But before we move on, I want to encourage you to sign up for my weekly video newsletter. The link is in the description or you can go to senseofmindshow.com newsletter to sign up for free. You'll get an exclusive video every week where I break down a fact about your brain, a happiness or productivity tip, a book recommendation, an inspiring quote, and my thoughts about life, culture, or current events, or news about sense of mind. You can only access these videos by signing up for the newsletter, which is free, ad-free, and secure. All right, now on to point three. What do these different receptors do? To figure out how something works, you have to play around with it. In fact, that's how many scientists who study serotonin receptors have figured out what these receptors do. They've discovered molecules that selectively stimulate or block a single subtype of receptor. They can then give these molecules to humans and observe what effects they have on physiology, brain function, or behavior. If one of them is proven to treat some condition, then scientists will isolate it and try to make it into a useful drug. This table comes from a 2020 review on serotonin receptors by Trevor Sharp and Nicholas M. Barnes, two of the foremost experts on 5-HT receptors. It shows some of the consequences of stimulating or blocking each of the serotonin receptors. And in the rest of the videos in this series, we will be diving into most of the effects as well as a theory about the overall function of the serotonin system. So don't worry if it feels like I'm not going into enough detail because I will cover all the major effects of serotonin in depth in subsequent videos. Okay, back to the table. Since we're mainly interested in the human brain, let's ignore the middle column titled effects in rodent models and focus on the one to the right of it titled effects in clinical trials. We'll also focus on the column titled pharmacological manipulation. There you can see the words agonist and antagonist, which essentially mean receptor activator for agonist and receptor blocker for antagonist. 
So just like an antagonist in a story tries to block the efforts of the protagonist or agonist, a receptor antagonist blocks the receptor agonists from activating the receptor. For example, stimulating or agonizing the 1A receptor can produce antipsychotic, antidepressant, or anti-anxiety effects, as anxiolytic literally means disintegrating anxiety. And it can increase sexual desire in some women. Yet blocking or antagonizing the receptor can also have antidepressant effects. How is that possible? And why is it only that certain molecules seem to produce certain effects if they're activating the same receptor? There are three answers to these questions. First, one subtype of receptor can be present either postsynaptically, meaning it is on the receiving neuron, or presynaptically, meaning it is functioning as a serotonin reuptake pump on the sending neuron, in which case it is acting to stop serotonin from affecting the postsynaptic receptors. Secondly, even though the molecules might be acting on the same exact receptor, they can affect it in subtly different ways, and that can influence the neuron's likelihood of firing in subtly different ways, a phenomenon that we can call biased agonism. And thirdly, a given molecule can have a chemical structure that makes it more likely to interact with a presynaptic or postsynaptic receptor, even if the receptors themselves are pretty much identical. For example, the 1A receptor antagonist, pindolol, preferentially blocks 1A receptors on presynaptic neurons. And since, as I said, those presynaptic receptors function to remove serotonin from the synapse, blocking them leaves more serotonin in the synapse, just like how SSRIs work. To be clear, pindolol and many of the drugs on this list also work on different neurotransmitter systems, so their overall effects are likely a combination of how they affect all these systems. The serotonin system is also present in tissues throughout the body. Some diseases like irritable bowel syndrome can be treated with drugs that act on the serotonin receptors in those tissues. For example, 5-HT3 antagonists can treat diarrhea, while 5-HT4 agonists can treat constipation. Also, some serotonin drugs meant to affect only the brain can have side effects in the body. For example, 2B receptors are present in heart valve cells, and overstimulating them can cause fibrous tissue to accumulate, which can lead to heart disease. So drug makers routinely screen new drugs for 2B agonistic activity. Going back to that table, you'll see that serotonin affects depression, anxiety, psychosis, sexual dysfunction, migraines, perception, cognition, impulsivity, obesity, gastrointestinal processes, Alzheimer's disease, and even sleep. How can one system do all that? Partly because depending on the subtype, receptors, serotonin receptors, can excite or inhibit neuronal activity. The rest of the explanation lies in where serotonin receptors are expressed, including whether they're in the brain or peripheral organs, which brain regions, uh, which circuits within those regions, and even which types of neurons, and where exactly on the neuron they're found. For example, the same receptor can have a very different effect if it is expressed on an inhibitory interneuron, whose job is to shut down the activity of a given brain circuit, or on an excitatory neuron, whose job is to activate that same circuit. So in conclusion, this raises some questions. How is serotonin, the serotonin system, actually organized in the brain? Which receptors are expressed in which regions of the brain? And how does that help us to understand this supremely complex system? In the next video, we will answer all of these questions along with how and where serotonin is made in the brain and body. And as mentioned earlier, future videos in this series will tackle serotonin's role in many of the cognitive and behavioral effects listed in the table we looked at above. So make sure to subscribe to this channel and click the bell icon so you don't miss any of those new videos. One last thing, can you do me a favor? If you enjoyed this video, please like it and share it with anyone who might find it interesting or useful. Also, let me know if you have any feedback on this new format for Sense of Minds videos. 
As always, this channel is brought to you by the Diamond Mind Foundation, and this video was written and produced by me, Andrew Cooper Sansone. Thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you next time.